a reminder, over the last few weeks, we started off on week one discussing building firm foundations, and the landing point there was really looking to spend time together, if possible, weekly. Second week was the art of communication, about uh, hearing, speaking clearly, and listening well. Then last week was about resolving conflict, and uh, we used this triangle last week that uh, when a husband and a wife, if they're at the bottom end of the triangle and God is at the top, as we get closer to God, we also get closer to each other. This evening, we're looking at this really, really great subject, the power of forgiveness. I came across a um, quote <laughs> this afternoon when I was busy preparing, which I thought was quite uh, insightful. It says, if people put as much work into their marriage as they will have to into a divorce, more people would be happily married. And the reason you're here is because you're putting in the effort, you're putting in the work, so well done. Great, uh, great thing to do. <laughs> learning to say sorry and learning to forgive in a marriage is exceptionally important because we all do things that will hurt each other. It's one thing portraying the perfect marriage out there, but when push comes to shove, deep down in the engine room of our marriages, it's invariable that some things that I do and have done have hurt Jackie, some of them deeply, and some things that she's done have hurt me. Some of those things have been quite inadvertent, where at the time we didn't realize that what we're doing was hurtful, uh, but through the process of talking and trying to figure it out, uh, we saw what our actions had done to the other person. How well we deal with hurt in a marriage in some ways talks to how strong our relationship will be. If I could use this picture as an example tonight, I'm gonna to build it in a moment. If there's trust in a relationship, that leads to openness, vulnerability, which leads to intimacy, a, a, that feeling of connection that we've been speaking out, uh, about along this course. When we do something that causes hurt, that circle of trust, openness, and intimacy gets broken. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to see this. We learn this from the very earliest age, on the playground at school with little kids, when they have friendship breakdowns, uh, very often the result will be, well, I'm not talking to you anymore. And so we understand from a very young age that emotional hurt, emotional disconnect breaks the circle. When it comes to marriage, it's amplified because we've effectively vowed on our wedding day to spend the rest of our lives together, but we anticipated that it would be with a circle going the whole time. And when it breaks down, it's very, very difficult and, and pulls deep emotions from within our souls and creates the sense of disconnect. But that's the reason for tonight's subject. When any hurt is properly healed, and there's different levels of hurt as well, then the circle can go round again, leads to trust, openness, intimacy, and when hurts come, we learn how to heal them, and uh, the circle keeps going. I remember the, hearing the story of a teacher who had a, an empty sweet jar in her classroom at the beginning of the year, but she had sweets in the drawer, and she said to her kids, every time you do something commendable, sweets will go into the jar. So she would get them to come up and if little Johnny did something great, he would come up, grab some sweets and shove them into the jar. And then at a period of, after a period of time, maybe a term, then all the kids would share the sweets and they'd celebrate together. The converse was also true that if a child misbehaved, they would come and take a sweet out of the jar and put it back in the drawer. I really enjoyed that analogy because it speaks to this idea of trust, openness and intimacy in a marriage. All of our actions of kindness in our marriage towards each other are putting sweets into the jar. The levels of trust go up and up and up. Equally, when we have disconnect, some sweets come out of the jar, we have little misunderstandings, but it's possible with some really big hurtful actions that we can empty the jar almost completely with just a few stupid, silly things. Of course, other trust drains out just little by little, and, and what's tragic is when a marriage over some years has more sweets go out of the jar than went in, you end up in this place of deficit while still together. And that's what we're speaking about tonight really is how to keep the sweets going into the jar. 
some of the things that take sweets out of the jar, some examples of these things that can cause hurt are, for example, decisions made without consultation. I told the story last week and Jackie is here tonight and I went back and I fed back very honestly on everything I'd said to you um, so that she didn't have to listen to the audio the next day when the email came out. Um, but decisions made without consultation, just take a few sweets out of the jar. It's not like handfuls, just a few sweets. When a desire for conversation by one spouse is met with coldness or busyness or just being brushed off by the other spouse, takes a few sweets out of the jar. When mistakes are met with criticism rather than kind of encouragement and talking it through in a, a clever way, kind way, sweets come out of the jar. When one spouse feels like the other one is constantly having their time squeezed out by other things, for example, uh, when a wife puts her children first and the husband starts to feel, without saying a whole heap, like he's number two, three, four, five, or six on the list. And conversely, when a husband puts work, friends, sport, leisure, all those things, and a wife starts to feel I'm way down on the list. I was having a conversation with a guy the other day, and he's now, his kids are grown up. Um, some of them have already left home, and they have an amazing family, a family I really respect. And he said a turning point for his family came some years back. After the children were born, he said he started to feel uh, like all his wife did was be a mom. And they went on this parenting course. And in this parenting course, it spoke about the need for parents to put each other first because one of the kids would grow up and leave home and kids thrived when parents were happy. And he said something just clicked in the marriage that they figured out that the best way for them to live was to have this relationship primary and then parent from that position. When an act of kindness is met with a feeling of ingratitude, hurt comes into this circle. And then possibly one of the most damaging things in a marriage is when one person feels that the other is treating them with contempt. This is a very subtle thing. Contempt needn't be with great anger and shouted words. It can just be with facial expressions. Our words can stay the same even. But when the, when the feel is contempt, big lightning bolt of hurt that goes into a marriage. When we feel hurt, we tend to react. That goes for every single one of us. Now at a physical level, we can understand this much more easily. You put your hand on the stove plate and it burns, you immediately react, you pull it away. We do the same thing at an emotional level and, and I've got a list of four different reactions here. I'm gonna stop after the first one, ask you to self-identify in your group as to which of these you are. But when it comes to hurt, the, one of the reactions, and there's four that I'm gonna go through, but one of them that we react with is often anger. Is there anybody seated here who has never ever been angry with their spouse? Thank you, Jackie, for putting up your hand. I really appreciate that. Although it's a lie, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one. We react with anger. Now, anger doesn't always look the same. And in the Alpha Marriage Course, they give us a very helpful picture of two animals. And sometimes, some of us lean more towards the one kind of animal and some of us lean more towards the other when we get angry. The first animal is the rhino. When the rhino personality gets angry, they just put their head down and they charge. That's not to say that Every single thing you do every day is a rhino, but it's when it really, when that heat gets turned up, you, you don't actually care what's in your way, you are just belting it out forward. But some people, when they're angry, are a different kind of animal, they're a hedgehog. They just curl up in a ball, put all their little spikes on the outside, and just retreat within themselves. Now, when a rhino is married to a rhino, we speak about internal personality here, nothing on the outside, okay? When a rhino's married to a rhino, well, what's the result of that? Volcanic. 
When a rhino is married to a hedgehog, and this can be either husband or wife, generally one bulldozes and one retreats, but nothing's solved. And if two hedgehogs are married to each other, months sometimes <laughs> of both in their balls. Um, so this is quite a fun way of kind of trying to figure out what our, where our go-to place is on some of these. So I'm going to ask you just at your table, in just a, like a minute or two, to identify what you do. This might not be all the time, but where you lean towards if you think you're a rhino or a hedgehog. Please don't identify it for your spouse, just for yourself, okay? Go for it. What I love about this course is we're discussing a very serious question here. How do you react when you're angry? And I'm just hearing laughter everywhere. That's absolutely brilliant. So the first reaction, let me go back here, is can be anger. Another reaction to hurt is retaliation. Why would we retaliate when it's to somebody that we love? We retaliate when we hurt I guess to let our partner know what it feels like. If I feel like I'm the only one hurting at the moment and they have no idea what's going down inside of me, I think if I can just inflict a bit of hurt, at least we'll both be hurt together and that's better than just me being hurt all by myself. At a very, at a deep level, I, I heard this saying which I've seen to be true so often, hurt people hurt people but healed people heal people. Now the difficulty is that often we bring our hurts into a marriage that we had before. And some of the triggers on that stuff interacts with this relationship and next week the topic is uh, how we, the impact of family past and present. But retaliation can be absolutely devastating because it can start cycles. Where initial hurt starts a trigger reaction which produces a trigger reaction and who knows where that ends. A third reaction that we can have to hurt is the reaction of fear. I used the analogy just now of being burnt on a stove plate. When you get burnt as a kid, your mom and dad try to teach you, don't touch, don't touch, don't touch, but you knew better and I knew better. At some point we skipped through their defenses and we grabbed hold of something really hot. We pulled away and something happened in our brains at a chemical level that we weren't aware of at that time, but a pathway was formed that said, that hurts, fire, heat, stove plate, heater, whatever it is, or in my case, electricity hurts from getting stuff stuck in a plug and seeing it all um, spark and trip the lights. There's a chemical reaction in our brain to help us survive, which says, it hurts, don't touch. Now, if you take that into a relationship and that chemical reaction is also happening, you can get to a point where it's like, don't talk because it hurts. Or that person, my spouse, hurts, so don't touch, don't go near. And so out of fear, we withdraw. This is not a good thing, clearly. You're breaking that cycle that I spoke about earlier that should have trust, openness, and intimacy. And the fourth reaction, and you might... Uh, kind of think this is a slightly strange word, but is we experience feelings of guilt when hurts are at play. And very often this guilt comes from what we do. Now the weird thing about us is some of our actions, it's like we, we default to them. So if you take bowls, you know, bowls, not 10 pin bowling, the, yes, lawn bowling, thank you. Those bowls have got a bias. 
and they go straight for a little while, but then they pull to whichever direction the bias is in. And it's like we have a bias. We, we make a resolution. It's like I'm gonna, gonna be a better husband and gonna be a better wife. And we go straight for a little while and then our bias kicks in and we do some of the stuff that we thought we shouldn't be doing. But instead of apologizing and fixing it and having forgiveness flow, we defend it. Like, this is the way I am. And then we feel guilty for what we're causing in the other person, but it doesn't change us. It's not in the positive sense that we change our actions. We just feel guilty, but perpetuate that same stuff. We sometimes feel guilty for our reactions. In the heat of the moment, we retaliate. We think, well, they get to feel some of my pain. And then the anger subsides a bit, and you think, well, that was a stupid thing to do, but I can't undo it now. The toothpaste is out the tube. These are all the emotions and the reactions that go with hurt. Now, the hand, one of the handouts that's on your table is called Handling Anger. And it's for you to do as a couple. I'd like to just shoot through it before you start talking and split up. Is it asks you, so each person will fill out their own handout and you ask to score your, re your reactions get on a scale of naught to four in different events. And so you just need to read the key at the top quite carefully and then fill out the numbers as you go down. And at the bottom, when you add it all up, you'll get a score for predominantly hedgehog or predominantly rhino behavior. And then underneath that is your spouse's score. So we'll give this a few minutes. And what I'm asking you to do when you're done, wouldn't you just wave at me? I'm not sure how long this exercise will take everybody, so I'm just gonna rely on when like 80% of you are waving at me, then I'll know you're pretty much there. Is that okay? Go for it. The point that I would really like to make to us tonight is this. A normal, healthy relationship doesn't mean there's never hurt. A healthy relationship is dealing well with hurt learning to resolve conflict and learning to forgive. So this Alpha Marriage course isn't about painting this ideal of we never ever misunderstand, we never ever conflict, we never ever hurt each other, but it is saying a normal, a healthy working relationship, a godly one is one in which hurt is expressed, where it's forgiven and then we work it out. But in many of our relationships, hurt doesn't get worked out properly, it doesn't get worked out quickly. And what ends up happening is that we bury hurt. <clears throat> like little landmines, they sit underneath the surface and it doesn't look like there's anything there. But if anything else comes onto that particular spot, poof, now there's a double hurt. And we can end up with so much stuff buried beneath the surface that we actually, it, it affects us. Even if you've got one big hurt that's buried or lots of little ones that aren't dealt with properly, these are some of the, things that happen to us with buried hurt. Now, this is a long list I'm gonna shoot through of symptoms that we get physically in our behavior and in our emotions when hurt is buried. There's a point I'm trying to make. Buried hurt is bad for you and it's bad for me. First of all, let's talk about physical symptoms. When hurt is buried, we very often have disturbed sleep. Buried hurt can lead to change in appetite. It can lead to medical conditions, e.g. ulcers, high blood pressure, etc. Some people can have physical pain because of buried hurt underneath the surface. This is not good for us. We behaviorally change as well. When there's hurt that's buried, we have an inability to relax. One of the reasons for that is that we tend as humans to nurse and rehearse our pain. Don't know about you, but that would be true of me. If there's been some pain in our marriage, I nurse that, look after it very carefully, and then I rehearse it. And what ends up happening is that all of us have got a little, that little narrator in our head and he starts to piece together this whole story of how little Jackie cares for me, how little she does, how little, how this, that, the next thing, most of which, as a 99.9% of it is not true, it's just that she didn't get me on this and I didn't get her, whatever that is. 
So we don't relax because there's this processor in our brain dealing with the hurt. It lowers sexual desire. There's a good reason to want to learn to forgive and get to tonight's point. Leads to a quick temper, intolerance. People with buried hurt sometimes look to escape through drugs, alcohol, pornography, etc. Often you unpack some of the reasons why people are getting into some of those stuff is as an escape to get away from hurt. Some people, if, if those are some of the one kind of escapes, some of us escape into work, to our children, into religious activity, etc., as a way of numbing the pain or getting away from all of these different landmines. And then what about the emotional symptoms? This goes on long enough, hurt is buried. We start to lose a sense of positive emotion. It's like dark thunderclouds just are over our, over our feelings with all of the world. We, we can develop low self-esteem and taken further, even fall into a kind of depression. We can live with the fear of confrontation when there's been enough buried pain and it's not being dealt with well. And this can lead in some circumstances to kind of an, an emotional shutdown. I've spoken to people who, when they talk about how their relationship's working at the moment, they use these kinds of words. They say, emotionally, I've shut down towards my spouse. For some people, this marriage course might have been a very last stop because this has already happened and you're saying to yourselves, I, I don't actually know where to go further. It, you, you don't need to even be in it to know how damaging that is when there's the shutdown. That's, that circle trust connection is just not happening at all. Well, if that's all the bad news, and that's quite a lot, isn't that an amazing list of different things that buried hurt, what it does to us, how do we process and how do we walk this forward? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to identify the hurt, to identify the hurt. This takes some initiative to resolve the anger, to resolve the hurt, to, to say, I'm not just gonna nurse and rehearse, but we need to fix this, not just fight about it. It's important in this process that we identify the pain our partner has caused us, but equally, the pain that we've caused them. Here's the deal. If I'm hurting, I generally don't see the pain I've caused Jackie. I'm just thinking about myself. And for forgiveness to happen, for resolution to happen, both parties need to figure out, this. first of all, how I've been hurt, and then how I've caused pain to my partner. Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24 says this. Therefore, Jesus is speaking, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. He was speaking in the context of this great big temple that was in the middle of Jerusalem and people would go all the way to the temple to drop money or some kind of um, offering to God. And Jesus was saying, you know what? If you're going to do this connection with God and you realize you're disconnected from somebody else, go and make that right and then come and give your gift to God. If this is true for relationships in a community, how much more true is it for marriage? Jesus is basically saying, identify the hurt and fix it. Don't just let it multiply and roll forward. To do this, we need to be prepared to tell our partner where we have been hurt. This is sometimes crazily difficult. Uh, rhinos sometimes don't tell how they hurt, they just charge. And hedgehogs very often struggle to tell how they hurt because they're just self-protecting. Telling how we've been hurt in itself is quite vulnerable because it's not shouting and screaming, you are the most useless, because last week we said you can't use most, always, or, da, you, ba, 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 ba. It's, I was hurt when you did that. When somebody knows how they've hurt me, I'm also vulnerable because if they did it again and again and again, they would know that it's gonna hurt me again and again and again. But I'm guessing we got married to each other because we loved each other right there in the beginning, somewhere, somehow, 
and we're not doing this intentionally. We only hurt, we hurt because we're hurting. And if we could fix both of us, every time we get hurt, we could have an amazing marriage. Jesus gave this instruction. He said, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. If this is true in friendship, again, how much more true in marriage? It's as if Jesus is saying, go and find some safe space to talk. And if you've been hurt, point that out and, and explain how. Not with all the machine gun fire that I spoke about last week, but with an honesty that says those three things actually were the thing. The sad thing, I guess, is that some people have hurts that started when they were dating, were never expressed, carried on into their marriage, through their honeymoon, into the first couple of years, and, and have never been properly resolved. And, and so landmines just end up getting buried, buried next to landmines, and you as a spouse not go anywhere near there, there's just gonna be an explosion, so we don't go near there. That's not solution, that's just avoidance. And it's like the heavenly father who invented marriage and who knows and loves all of us, he wants the best for my marriage, gives us an instruction, go and show each other where it's really hurting and fix that. The idea of a father being so caring, so behind us, so for our marriages, so fantastic, is he gives us the courage to be able to express where we've been hurt and then to take it further because part two of how to, be, how to find forgiveness and find healing is to apologize. Now, if you've got a bad mechanism of doing this, as soon as somebody identifies their hurt, the other person just gets defensive. It's like, well, I didn't mean that. And then you both withdraw and you say, well, I'm not going back to that conversation again. So this requires quite high levels of uh, maturity and quite high levels of humility. Is that when Jackie points out how I've hurt her, very often I feel defensive. Vice versa, when I've sometimes pointed out she's hurted me, hurted, <laughs> fix the way I speak, Jackie. <laughs> she can feel defensive. But when we put ourselves in that person's shoes and try and understand what was it like to, what were they going through, why, what, how, try and get to grips with that. I need to be able to come to a place of apologizing. True, proper apologies involve taking responsibility and not trying to just pass the blame. For example, Jackie might say, I felt, it just put me out a little bit, I just felt a little bit hurt when you stayed out an extra two hours and I had no idea where you were. I tried to get hold of you, but I didn't know where you were. I could say, well, I'm sorry about that, but you know, you've so often, you've got your phone on silent, wouldn't have even mattered if I had have called, but I'm sorry. That's passing the blame. It's not a proper apology. A proper apology might sound something like this, I'm sorry that you felt like that when I didn't call. I'm gonna do my best not to do it again. Or, if it's a serious misunderstanding, discuss it, discuss it, discuss it, and say, how can, this is a better solution, let's try it for next time, as we discussed last week. Inside every single one of us, there's an urge to defend and explain our own actions. And because it's in a marriage, we try and project blame for most of our stuff onto the other person. If we're both doing that, <laughs> we're in some trouble. And so this is why it takes a bit of humility, a bit of courage to pause, even if I'm feeling defensive, and to try and figure it out, to try and listen, and then to apologize for those things, and to accurately convey how I've been hurt and then to graciously accept an apology. I would love to say <clears throat> that I stand up here <clears throat> having got this right 100% of the time in all the years that we've been married. But if I was gonna be honest, I'd have to say I, I do this wrong more often than I do it right. Not that we don't, but the mechanisms, because when my emotions get involved, I, that I just wanna bah, 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 just a bit more. And very often when I've gone and prayed to the Father, I've just felt them say to me, my boy, you better go and say sorry, that's my daughter. We need to learn how to apologize. First of all to God, receive his forgiveness, and then to each other and receive their forgiveness. I don't think there's anything more powerful 
in a relationship than true forgiveness being extended to the other person. We're gonna speak about that in a moment. The exercise that we're gonna do now, before you pick up the page, I'd like to explain it a bit to you. I reckon this exercise has the potential to be the most powerful one in the whole of the Alpha Marriage course. It requires a level of honesty. It also requires a level of courage. On this piece of paper, there's a lot of stuff written down, and I'm gonna try and simplify it by explaining it like this. You've been given a blank piece of paper. On one side of the blank piece of paper, I'm gonna ask you to write down, if you can think of them, five ways in which you have hurt your spouse. Five ways in which you have hurt your spouse. Before you discuss it, on the reverse side of that page, please write down five ways in which you feel that your spouse has hurt you. If you could pick up this printed page that says week four, the power of forgiveness, identifying unresolved hurt. I'd like to just use some of these as an example. Um, if you turn it over to where it says identify unresolved hurt continued. <laughs> these are good statements of expressing your own hurt. For example, I felt unsupported and unappreciated when you didn't notice the hard work I put into decorating the house for Christmas. You're on that same paragraph as me? Somebody else might look at that and say, well, that's silly to feel hurt by that. This is identifying your hurt. The second one says, I was hurt when you didn't say anything special about my promotion. I haven't got over the fact that you lied to me on the night we first went out together. That's expressing hurt. I felt rejected when you went out on I went out to the pub on the night we got back from honeymoon. I feel frustrated because you don't discuss financial decisions with me. That would be examples of ways that I'm feeling, I'm expressing. So on one side of this page, you're gonna write five sentences that say, I felt hurt when this happened. On the back of the page, write down five ways in which you think you might have heard your, hurt your spouse. Depending on where you're at, the exercise could have just taken a minute or two, or you could have looked at that page and thought, 10 minutes isn't gonna cover what we need to get through. So I'd like to give you the rest of the handles because we're talking about putting tools in the toolbox. And the third, if the second thing is apologizing and the homework exercise is helping us to do this well, then the third thing, and this is really the crux, this is the hinge moment, is to forgive. Forgiveness is one of the greatest forces in a marriage relationship, one of the greatest forces for good, one of the greatest forces for healing, for closeness, for intimacy, for rebuilding trust. There's different degrees of forgiveness, I guess, different difficulties. Forgiving somebody for being late is a whole lot different to forgiving somebody for marital unfaithfulness. But it's all forgiveness. It might just be at different levels. And I'd like to suggest that the Bible teaches that forgiveness is foremost a choice, not an emotion. If we wait until we feel like forgiving, until we forgive, there are some things that we literally may never forgive. My great uncle was a, an intriguing, eccentric old man named Uncle Claude. We loved visiting him because he is, when we were kids, he'd always give us f um, five bucks. And so Uncle Claude was like an ATM, we loved him. But when I got a lot older, and after I got married, came to realize that Uncle Claude was a very, very tragic man. He's passed away. But he got married to his first wife during the Second World War. He went off to fight. And when he came back from that war, his wife had married his best friend in his absence. He later on married another lady and lived with her for many, many, many years. When they were much older, she passed away 
And three months later, he married his next door neighbor, who was a, um, had been a spinster, and they were happily married until Uncle Claude passed away. But one day I got into this conversation with Uncle Claude. Now he's happily in the middle of his third marriage. He's in his 80s. And he starts to tell me the story of his first wife. Do you know that he spoke with as much venom in his 80s as I'm guessing he would have had back then? He had never truly forgiven. And one of the misconceptions we have about internal pain, emotional pain, is that time will heal it. Strangely enough, it doesn't. Time just dulls it. Only true forgiveness can actually heal this pain. The Bible says this very strongly. It says it as a command. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. That sentence right there describes the occasional marriage that I've seen. And it says, it gives a solution. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. The power and the impulse for forgiveness is given to us in this passage, along with Matthew chapter 18. God isn't saying here, don't worry about it. It shouldn't have been such a big deal. This verse implies that things happen that need forgiving. This verse implies I'm gonna end up hurt some days. But Paul says the impulse for forgiveness to somebody else is my forgiveness that came from God. If you've come to faith in Christ, the process would have involved something like this. All of my sin that I've ever committed is a sin against God. And faith in Christ involves something like this saying, God, I'm so sorry for how I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. It's possible that there's people seated here that have never prayed a pray like that. My hope is that you won't finish this alpha marriage course before you do. If I pray that prayer, the Bible says instantly, God forgives me. He doesn't hold that list for the rest of my life against me like a gun to my head. He forgives me. And Paul says, just as God forgave you, so you should forgive each other. If you were to take all the sins I've ever committed against God, let's say they reached up to the top of that roof. They would be much higher, but let's just limit it for now. All the sins that Jackie's ever committed against me would be this big by comparison. But they hurt equally the other way around. And if I can forgive her and she can forgive me, I can do that because I look at the forgiveness Christ has given to me to pass on to her and vice versa. Forgiveness is not condoning another person's actions. Forgiveness isn't me saying to a person who's hurt me, everything you did was fine, it was all right. It's not that. But what forgiveness is, it's letting go. You see, when we don't forgive, we the ones that suffer the most. I heard somebody say this, bitterness or unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. It actually, unforgiveness hurts me more than it hurts the other person. It's poison for my soul. God doesn't say this because he hates me. He says it because he loves me. He knows when I'm not forgiving towards Jackie, I'm bad for myself. And so he says, Steve, forgive just as God forgave you. If I can find this forgiveness and I should be able to because of God's forgiveness towards me, then the fourth part is starting with a fresh page. Do you know the amazing thing God says about our sins? He says he takes them as far as the east, is, it takes them as far away as the east is from the west. That's a Bible way of saying they, it's infinitely forgotten by God. If you and I truly forgive, it means we get to start with a fresh page. And I'd like to suggest that 1 Corinthians 13, there's not a suggestion, there's a Bible verse. 1 Corinthians 13, five says, love keeps no record of wrongs. A forgiving, healthy relationship is a relationship where genuine hurt has been discussed and forgiven. 
and that page torn out and thrown away, and we start with a fresh page, we know hurt's gonna come again, but it's not on the back of a long, long list. Yeah, look at what you did now. You did that, 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 going back 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, four years ago, and now you're doing this, 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 this. Forgiveness, once it's true forgiveness, involves tearing out the page and saying we start with a fresh page. The next little hurt comes, we forgive that, deal with it, tear out the page, and we walk forward. I'd like to tell you the story of a couple that did the Alpha Marriage course with us last year. We didn't know most of their story, we were just getting to know each other in the group. And we did this week, they went home, and the next week when we started, week five, I just went around the group and said, does anyone have any feedback? And the bloke stuck up his hand, he said, I wanna tell my story. He said, last week, when my wife wrote down those five things, and I wrote down my five, when I looked at them, I knew this was gonna need a whole lot more than just 10 minutes. He said, we scheduled an appointment with each other for the following night. It happened to be a Friday night. And he said, we went and sat on our balcony that overlooked the Kloof Gorge. And he said, we started to discuss all our unresolved hurts going back years and years. And he said, I realized the stuff I'd done to hurt her. And she realized the stuff that she'd done to hurt me. And we spoke for four hours and we came to a place of forgiving each other for all of that stuff. <clears throat> and then he said, we went inside and we got a tray of eggs. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. <clears throat> he says, <clears throat> we took one egg at a time and we named that egg with everything that we had discussed, every issue. And one at a time, we threw that egg over the edge of the balcony, never to be seen again. He was in tears. His wife was in tears telling the story. He says, this last week has been radically different for us. We finally have forgiven each other for, every, for all the stuff. I have no idea what they wrote on that list, but you could see in her face that she had forgiven and you could see in his that he had forgiven, that both received each other's forgiveness. I loved the idea of throwing eggs. It was their way of saying, it's a fresh start. That egg's gone. We're not getting it back together again. Just a comment on the process of forgiveness. If I forgive, that doesn't mean instantly nothing's wrong with me because when we receive emotional wounds, often there's bruising around that. And so when I forgive, it's a, it's a way of saying there's a fresh start, let's walk into healing together. Oh, I'm walking into healing. So it's not waving a magic wand and thinking nothing happened. It's acknowledging what did happen and saying I've chosen to forgive. Sometimes that's a daily choice but I'm walking forward into my healing that the bruising lifts out. One of the best ways to back up our sorries and to back up our forgiveness is with lots of new sweets in the jar of kindness, thoughtfulness, all the little things that are so important in marriage. And of course, to pray for our spouse. For those of you that were at the Flourish Women's Conference, you'd have seen an incredible story by an amazing lady that had me in tears. That couple is here tonight at the Alpha Marriage Course. And I'd like to show Denise's story. They're seated over there. And after this video has played, I've asked her husband, Dale, to come up and to pray for all of us. This is an amazing story of forgiveness at the very deepest level. And please turn your attention to the screens. My husband and I married young. We've now been married 21 years, but um, he proposed on my 21st. And um, we were married about nine years when we decided to start having children, or try having children. It took a lot longer than I thought. And um, my first miscarriage was kind of where I fell off the rails a little bit. At that stage, my husband and I started drifting. We literally had started living our own lives. And um, just got busier and busier and wrapped up in busyness. And our paths, just kind of started drifting a little. I was craving adventure, craving excitement, and so I met somebody. I started lying to my husband, and um, when he was on night shift, I'd go out at night, and got quite involved with this guy and his friends. Um, started experimenting with ecstasy. Ultimately, I had an affair with this guy. Um, it started off quite badly. Um, it was against my will. 
but I continued the relationship and um, I then found out I was pregnant. I realised I had to tell my husband and I had to make a decision but obviously I was not excited about the pregnancy, something I'd wanted for so long and now that it had arrived I'd hoped I'd miscarry again. He, he was broken, he, um, I absolutely broke his heart. He was devastated and at that stage I, I didn't feel anything, I, I actually was completely numb and again it felt like a surreal world. Um, we I agreed we'd go for counselling. Coming from the background um, where I'd expected judgment and harsh criticism, I was prepared for a fight and the fight never came. Piet and Jen were so loving, so amazing, it completely floored me. My husband at this stage, he um, said he wanted to save our marriage, that he still loved me, that he forgave me and that no matter whose child it was, he would stand by me. My heart was wanting me to leave. My head, however, and here again, I thank God for the Christian upbringing that I had because years and years of the gospel, years and years of the Bible, years and years of walking with God came back like a flood. And I just knew in that moment that although I'd stepped off path, I just knew if, I'd, if I actually left at that moment, I felt like I'd be completely stepping out of God's will and His hand in my life and I'd be turning my back on Him and I wouldn't have Him anymore. It was the worst nine months of my life. I had a very stressful, stressful pregnancy. Most um, people who knew we'd been trying obviously came and congratulated us and were so happy for us and said, you must be so thrilled and what could I do but just smile and say thank you. In the meantime, I was dying and I was I was petrified, I'd wake up with night sweats, I was stressed, I would have panic attacks, I would worry about what the outcome was going to be, would Dale still stay with me if it wasn't his child, what was I going to do? Um, it was the hardest to forgive myself when the reality of what had actually gone down hit me and what I was facing. One night, woke up in the middle of the night and I was, I felt so nauseous, I wanted to vomit and I felt so... If anyone's had a panic attack, they would know. I, I, was, I was beside myself. And I walked into the toilet and I actually heard God speak to me for the first time ever in my life. I actually heard this quiet voice in my head saying, Denise, it's gonna be okay. Relax, I've got this, it's going to be okay. And it's the first time a complete calm settled over me. The paternity results came back and relief flooded over us when it was 99.999%. Dale was the father. The look in his eyes changed. He just embraced this baby who had saved our marriage and his whole expression changed. It was just the most precious and amazing moment to know that God had come through for us, had honoured my husband's love, had honoured my husband's faithfulness. My husband never brought it up again. He just loved me and it's love that saved me.